Well, thank you. Appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak to everybody out there and to Michael Carcelli and, and the whole team at Flya. This is great, a great organization. We're very thrilled to be here. And as we get rolling through the, our, our show, we're going to be talking about, well, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Chris Sloan. I'm a vice president at Boomerang Capital Partners. And I'm joined by Rob Jaffick, one of the founders and a principal of Boomerang Capital Partners that started back in 2006. So what we're going to talk a little bit about today, of course, is, is essentially how we fund fix and flip real estate to really just get out and say it, right? Okay, we are a hard money lender that lends to folks who are doing fix and flips. Now that's it in a nutshell. However, those terms have really evolved quite a bit. We're actually doing lending that is value add to single family, to, to borrowers who are improving and adding value to single family properties. And they're adding value basically we like to say that we're, we're adding value to communities that we're involved in one loan at a time. We'll get more into that as we look at the process here and we'll, we'll discover, we'll, we'll sort of break down and unpack some of these, this, some of this terminology. Okay, so let me start off by talking about something we, we heard a little bit about earlier from Ernest. So, Funny story, right? We're, we definitely have a deficit of housing in the U.S. And I was recently at a presentation where I was speaking on this topic. And lo and behold, we had a, we had a PhD gentleman in the audience who had spoken earlier. He was actually the keynote speaker. He's a PhD professor from University of Denver in the real estate department. So I say that we're short in the U.S. housing market by about two, two and a half million single family homes. And I hear this person yell out as loud as they can, wrong. And so I'm thinking, well, I'm getting heckled already. Never happened before, but okay. So I look over and sure, the professor took off his bow tie. He really did a bow tie on it, put on a red polo. And I said, okay. He said, the number's more of like between four to six million. So I took him at his word, given that he has a PhD in real estate and I don't. So I took that for what it was worth. But whatever the number is, there's a significant deficit in single family and all and all housing units we have to focus on single family residential but there's a, there's a def, a, certainly a deficit everywhere so well it's not a big surprise right 2007 to 2009 the great recession this is from the national association of home builders what happened here is well they stopped making homes and it's very evident but we didn't stop making people and so there's a, there's a delta, a huge delta, a huge gap here between the orange line at the top, which is the population growth and the number of units available. So that, that drives a lot of problems right there. And if you, okay, this is, this is actually very interesting. In my opinion, if you look at the demographics of who are buying homes right now, you get a little bit of a blip up there with some of the some of the older um, some of the younger boomers rather who may be moving into senior living facilities and that type of thing, nicer homes, communities like that, senior senior living communities. But the real bubble in this, the real the real golf ball going through the cobra here is the millennials, which I find fascinating for a variety of reasons. The least of which is not the fact that I was at a conference probably ten years ago. And it was a, a gentleman who was a, another kind of a doctorate in social psychology. And he looked at different demographic groups and different dem demographic cohorts. And what I found was extremely fascinating about that was he said, it's different this time with millennials. They're not going to want to buy a house. They're not going to want to buy a car. They're not going to have a traditional job, work 40 years and go play golf. They're going to do different things. They're all about experience, right? They're about experiences. They're going to travel the world, backpack through Europe, and you know, sleep on in mom's basement until they get kicked out eventually. Well, they eventually did get kicked out. They married someone. They had kids. And they said, honey, we need to buy a house. So they are right now one of the largest cohorts of home buyers in the U.S. Yeah, so... 
an interesting thing. Um, oh, sorry. Jeremy's telling me I'm not turned on. All right, I'm good. So um, one of the interesting things to look at, we're gonna dig into this even more uh, in a little bit, but um, if you wanna go next slide, Jeremy. So this has happened before, right? So the first you know, golf ball through the Cobra uh, was, um, was the baby boomers. The baby boomers created significant dislocation when they were the first for, for the home buyers. So this is actually not the home prices now. This is 1975 through 1985. And, it, uh, and you can see the, the, the prices just keep going up and going up. It's not stellar. It's, it's just pretty steady growth. But you can see that there's two recessions in here. This is uh, Federal Reserve of, Sa of St. Louis. Uh, and they've got, um, there's, there's two recessions in there. The second recession, the much larger recession, it slows down. The first recession, it doesn't uh, slow down at all. And Jeremy, if you want to slip to the next slide, this is really stunning. Um, is that rates were going up during this period of time and it didn't slow down. We're gonna go through this uh, in quite a bit more detail, the impact of the rising rates and it absolutely makes a difference. But you can see that that is significantly outweighed by more buyers than sellers. Uh, Ernest talked a lot about uh, the decline in inventory. There's a couple different pieces of the decline in inventory which I find really interesting. One is, is that uh, like Chris spoke about, the, the boomers, the, the old guys aren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. So they were supposed to be downsizing. They would downsize and then they would have this, this, this move up market uh, and then we would have everybody moving up. But the guys at the top were supposed to be moving out and they were supposed to be downsizing and coming down here to Florida and those sorts of things. Uh, they're just not doing that. They are coming down to Florida, but they are not selling their primary residence to that next buyer. So uh, this, this chart shows that the, even though the rates are going up uh, in that time period, significantly, it didn't have an impact on, um, on the prices. It, it just didn't move. It's also interesting to note that that peak in, look at the right-hand scale, that's the, um, that's the rates. Those rates are 18%, 1-8%. And you can still see uh, it, it because, you know, honey, we've got kids, we've got to have a house. That primary driver still goes. And this is just to, to if you want to go to the next slide, um, this one is uh, um, Fannie Mae, uh, Fannie Mae forecast. So it's not just our forecast, it's somebody else's. Um, and if you look, it, one of the things that gets really confused in, um, in, the, in the media, when the media talks about it, they say, oh my goodness, look, the housing market has, has absolutely come to a standstill. The housing market, there's nothing going on. Um, uh, mortgages are down, you know, 70%. They're uh, conflating two different pieces of the market. They're conflating the refi market, which absolutely the refi market is, is going to slow down, right? Rates go up. Not everybody's going to refi, uh, way fewer people are going to refinance. But really what we want to focus on is the primary purchases, the first purchases. So if you look at the first purchase line, um, uh, that third line down, um, we're still going, uh, sorry, the fourth line down. Um, it, it's just steady. And you can look at the third line down and, and, and they are projecting um, prices to just continue to, 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 to move along. So those are the, the, that's two different pieces of the market and it's important to remember those. I'll talk about more of those later. Perfect. And then if you could advance the slide, Jeremy. Okay, great. So, so here's a great example, right? There's, there's charming and then there's two charming, right? The before picture <laughs> here. It's a little, it's got great bones. It's got really good character and it's got too much character. So this, this example here, Houston, Texas rehab budget, $45,000. This is a real property that's in our portfolio. And I'm gonna mention something about the portfolio in just a moment, but the before photo is what our, our borrower, we went out and found, we went and looked at this property. We got to know the borrower, we'll speak more about that. Then they turned it into the, the after photo. And the after photo is, is move in ready. Who's getting this home? This is probably a first time home buyer. This is a, probably a new family. This is gonna be somebody's primary residence. So we took what was an unserved, right? Underutilized home, maybe the HVAC, hot water heater, whatever. And the cosmetics clearly weren't working. They turned it into something that was functional and nice to look at curb appeal and with a price point that's reasonable. We'll get into that a little bit as well, what our average loan sizes are to the borrowers that we find out there. And you get the next slide, Jeremy. So this is 
this is really what drives a lot of what we do. It's the fact that the average age of a home in the U.S. right now is 42 years. I think that's pretty stunning. I mean, I've asked a lot of people this question. Most people get, get it wrong. I think we, we tend to look at the new shiny thing near us, right? We don't look at the older stuff. But there's a lot of older properties out there. And it, they have the ability to be to be upgraded. So I'm, I'm impressed by this number. And most people are, are, like I said, clearly getting this wrong. But this presents a huge opportunity for us to, again, improve the housing stock, to, Im to improve communities one loan at a time. And you can advance it. Thank you. Okay. This is, this is kind of what we live by at, at Boomerang Capital Partners for the Boomerang Capital Finance Fund. And let me just say, before I launch into this, just a couple of points. Our goal at Boomerang Capital, we've got a lot of them, but one of the key goals in the fund is to deliver a steady, steady income stream, 10 to 12% in that neighborhood. That's an annualized number. Some people take it monthly, some, some people take it quarterly, some people roll it in and let the compounding do its magic, right? But the key point is, is we have a, we have a first lien position on all the loans that we make. So you've got, it, you've got stability. Thirdly, you've got something that does not correlate to traditional stocks and bonds. This is not traditional assets at all. And that's beautiful. You're probably already loaded up with stocks and bonds, hopefully not too many bonds in your portfolio, but certainly equities. And in this, in this scenario, you're going to get something that's not, not related to that at all. So let's start with origination. So when we do something a little bit differently around at Boomerang, we have a relationship with all our borrowers. We get out there on the origination side, and we want to go out and find borrowers through different conferences, through real estate individuals, through wholesalers. We, we have a lot of ways to get to know them. We get to know them very well. Are they, a formal, are they a former general contractor? Were they a plumber? Were they a sub? Were they in the electrical trade? Whatever. Who's, who's going to do this project? Can they see it through from soup to nuts, right? We want to make sure they can do that. Do we like the project? Do we like the neighborhood? Do we like the area they're in? Does it make sense? Is it pencil right from 10,000 feet? If so, we then start to look at the underwriting which is, okay, we like the deal, we like the market, we understand that you can execute Mr. and Mrs. and, and Mr. and Mrs. borrower. Now let's take a look at how you look financially. Does this make sense for you, your balance sheet, your income statement? Does that drive, can that drive this process? Can you be successful? And can we have confidence? And can we sleep well at night? Because ultimately, I think one of the things you'll notice is I wanna make sure, and we wanna make sure at Boomerang, is we, we all sleep well at night. This is sleep well at night money, okay? That's, that's really the goal. So we originate them, we underwrite them from a financial standpoint. A lot of people look at that broker price opinions. Everybody's weighs in on this, internal and external to our company. That's huge. Then we go to servicing. Now, servicing is, I think it's a, an underutilized area, right? Because a lot of folks like to ship this out and, and have somebody else do it. It's not really fun to do for a lot of different companies, but we love it because this is our finger on the pulse of everybody, every borrower we lend money to. Right now, we've got about 600 loans out in the marketplace. Maybe it's a little higher than that. We'll show you a map and a bit of where those are. But the servicing lets us know if the borrowers are performing. This is huge. We want to make sure that the borrowers, if they're late, let's say we have a late borrower. Well, okay, what's the reason? Did they avoid the call seven for the seven calls and they picked up on the eighth call only to tell us that they'll get it to us next week, the funds? Or did they say like, Betty, hey, you know what? I'm really sorry. I thought I paid that. I'm going to wire the money before end of business today. All right. So two different borrowers, I'm giving you polar examples clearly, but the idea is that we get quantitative and qualitative information when you service these loans. And then, of course, and I'm going to let Rob talk about this later, a little bit more about the draw process when they, when they hit a certain milestone on the property, on the project, what's going on there. So we release more funds because we don't just write a big blank check and have them go crazy. Right. That would be that would be not mitigating the risk. Right. This is all about risk mitigation. 
Which brings me to the last piece, which is about positioning. So if we've got 600 loans, we don't want them all at the same stage. We don't want them all in the same state. We don't want them all accomplishing the same goal. Some are shorter term, some are longer term, some are, some are more cosmetic, some are less cosmetic, some are more intensive, some are knocking big, more walls down, some are knocking no walls down and, and taking wall to wall carpet out and just putting in tile or a hardwood floor, whatever it might be. But we don't want everybody to be the same low. We don't want a homogenous pool. We want diversity. Think of this, right? Think of this as a mutual fund of individual loans to borrowers that we know that we've under we've originated, underwritten, we're servicing, and now we're positioning that to make that a full diverse portfolio. And again, very key, really want a consistent income, relative preservation, relative solid preservation of principal vis-a-vis -a, -vis a first lien on the properties we loan money to. And again, no correlation or very low correlation to your traditional capital markets, equities, and fixed income. And with that, I'll let Rob maybe yeah. jump in a little bit and piggyback on those comments. Yeah, so let me uh, go ahead and hit the next. So one of the things that, that we want to talk a little bit about is the portfolio construction. And it's not necessarily, um, we're excited about our fund, it's great, uh, but um, want to help you kind of think through some of those sorts of issues if you're doing a portfolio if you're doing singles or if you're looking you know at, at managers like us so one of the easy ones to do right is uh look at the states look at your concentration by states right we're concentrated in um investor friendly non-judicial states uh i would suggest if you're doing something like um you know some of the other states that get a little bit trickier California, we don't do California at all. You would want to do a, uh, you would want to get a, a California specialized lender there. Um, if you want to hit next slide. Um, Chris talked a little bit about this. So uh, on the left-hand side, we, this is a, a fund summary that goes out to all of our investors on a quarterly basis. You can keep up with what we're doing and you can look at all the different ways that we're slicing and dicing the portfolio by state, by stage. Um, we tend to be very heavy in the light rehab type stuff uh, and not very concentrated up in the heavy and those sorts of things. But I just, I just want to look at one piece of this. And really, this is uh, with uh, some of the comments that Ernest made. This has evolved over time, right? The, the fix and flip market used to be back in the 2000s. If, you, if anybody's that old and remembers these sorts of things, we had things called condo flip and those sorts of things. So it wasn't fix and flip, it was flip only. That's where we started, right? That's where this market started. And basically you were front running other people um, buying houses and you would, you would get a preferential point in line, those sorts of things. And then you would sell it out later, you would flip it out. Then going in, and then there was too much of that. Uh, and uh, we had the great financial crisis. There was a little bit of, probably a little bit of overbuilding, but there was too much. And these houses um, sat vacant for a period of time. Uh, people um, tore, tore, um, uh, tore the refrigerators out, took them with them, the appliances, all of those sorts of things. And these houses became in disrepair and they were un uninhabitable for a period of time. So now you've got to fix them uh, and, and, and then you can flip them back out. Um, really now what's going on is it's value added. So um, we talked about the, those, those, the, the large buyers, Black, um, Blackstone and those sorts of people, they want to buy move in ready houses. They want to put a renter in there right away. Um, these houses, most of these houses, as Chris talked about, they're 42 years old. You've got problems with aesthetics, absolutely. Um, but you've also got problems with systems, the HVAC and those sorts of things. So that's how the market's evolved. It's really evolved into this value added. But um, you don't want all of the houses in the same stage. So if you go to the next uh, slide, Jeremy, you can see, um, you know, it's got to get from point A to point B, but it's got to go through the valley first. So next slide, Jeremy. We talk about the J curve a lot. People talk about this in commercial and then they don't talk about it uh, for some reason over in residential. You're going to take a house that's in disrepair. It's not in great. Somebody's living in it, so it's not that horrible. But the first thing you're going to do is you're going to discover, you're going to do two things. Number one, you're going to figure out that it's it doesn't work. Um, Ernest talked a little bit about um, 
uh, nobody wants to sit in the same room and see, uh, you know, see where they sleep, where they eat and where they work all in one. So, you know, we used to want to uh, open up those walls. Now we're going to want to create some separation and those sorts of things. So there's the functionality piece, the, the, the aesthetics piece, but then you've also got all of the plumbing and those sorts of things. So we're going to start with a reasonable house and we're going to take it apart. We're going to figure out more things that are bad and it's going to go down in value first and then it's going to go back up in value. So it's going to go through the J curve. You don't want all of your properties in that same position at the same time where you're in the, in the bottom, just in case something goes wrong, you have problems, uh, something systemic happens, those sorts of things. So you want a, a distribution. That's the distribution uh, that we worry about that uh, was on the prior slide. And if you go to the next slide, this is gonna be the finished product. product, uh, product. This is beautiful, um, of course, uh, but, and this is, you've got a lot of value uh, latent value or that margin of protection in there. And if you go to the next slide, this is why banks don't, this is one of the reasons banks don't lend uh, into this market um, is these are cash consuming assets, right? Banks underwrite to cash flow. These are cash consuming assets. So it doesn't work by charter. Uh, and that means that uh, it gives us the opportunity to provide the funding into that. The other reason banks uh, don't do that, they take a long time. We can close in as little as three days we don't usually close in as little as three days because then we're faster than title. But to keep up with these cash buyers and all of those sorts of things, we can absolutely do that. And if you want to go to the next slide, um, this is very difficult. You're, you're behind me by a couple slides, Jeremy. There you go. Next one. Next one. Uh, next one. There you go. One more. Okay, so um, so this is a this is a uh, this is one of our borrowers. We'll go through a, a sample um, a sample. This is one of the real value add um, borrowers that we have. So she uh, works mostly in Utah. She works in Utah, and she's uh, really what she looks for is what these are called banner properties. So um, a banner property is one that sits or a flag property. Uh, it sits between two. She's looking for them to sit between two streets it's a long skinny one and a lot of times what happens is is that's just the, there's a house is kind of on one street and then in the back there's just you know that stuff in the back what she does is she takes um uh fixes that first property and then puts an entire separate property on the back and then splits it uh, and gets the split all the way through um uh the municipalities and all that sort of stuff it's very difficult. It's actually difficult to do to understand the process and those sorts of things. So that's what she does. Um, if we look at one of her uh, properties, we can look at the next one. Um, so this one, uh, this is a little little higher. Our average price point uh, is somewhere in the four to five hundred thousand. This one's a little on the high side. So she bought it for five hundred eighty-five thousand. We lent four hundred thousand dollars against this. Uh, she put in another hundred and forty thousand dollars into this. So she's in it for about seven twenty-five, and she sold it for eight eighty-seven. That's not um, uncommon. That's a little bit on the high side, but that's uh, that's a pretty normal, um, uh, pretty normal um, uh, uh, ROE uh, for a borrower on that. And uh, as Chris talked about, we'll participate in the draw programs. We trust this woman immensely. She's done a number of projects, and we've we've financed them for. Her, but um, we all want to make sure we're on the same page. So we'll have a budget. We know where the budget is and there will be a, ser uh, there'll be a series of draws. When you're done with demo, you're probably gonna have a bill from your demo guys. Uh, so we'll there'll be a draw there. Uh, when you're getting towards the end, there's probably um, um, a draw time, about the time you're doing cabinets and that. And then you're gonna have a, a fairly substantial draw right, as, right at the end uh, where you're putting appliances and those sorts of things. So we'll participate in those. Um, we don't fully fund those, but we'll participate in those. And it gives us the opportunity to keep track um, of what's going on. So Jeremy's jumped to the next slide, which is awesome. That's good. I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, this is a, 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 a Harvard paper written in 1985. And, um, you know, there's, the, there, there's a saying, is there nothing new under the sun? And um, that was from, you know, a couple hundred years BC. So we're just going to look at history here. So you know, the, the, the idea here is, is that the, the millennials are pushing this whole thing. Uh, they're kind of non-economic buyers and that they've got another reason that they need to buy. So they're going to create some dislocations. They're going to ignore some of those fundamentals, uh, you know, the, um, the, the cost of financing and that sort of stuff. And it's going to create some dislocations. 
So the idea is this has happened before. So let's see what happened before and let's take this study and, and, and take it apart a little bit. So if you go to the next slide, um, Jeremy, here's, so um, again, it's 1985, this is Harvard. This is, um, he's looking at baby boomers. Uh, we're gonna try to apply those same things to millennials and see what we can learn. So, um, so here, uh, here he's gonna go through the kind of the things. So uh, our analysis of, of cross-sectional uh, data leads to, leads to three conclusions. First, large demographic changes of this sort have, uh, have observed and, um, and that's what the driver is. Uh, so that's, that's their first conclusion. Uh, second conclusions, uh, these fluctuations in demand appear uh, uh, to have substantial impact on housing, of course, and we're gonna look at that a little bit too. And then third, um, these demographic changes are gonna mitigate um, so they did, they did not uh, forecast another baby boom, but they're going to say it's going to uh, mitigate over time. So they're going to look at um, a number of these things, um, and um, and we're going to look at these um, in a lot more depth. That's what that's what this one is. Okay, so under the under the there uh, under the next one. So this is kind of their model. Um, this is the model that they're going to come up with, and they're going to, and we're going to look at a couple different things with this model. But um, the model exists; it, it it goes over a period of time, and you can see that it kind of starts in 1960, but then it continues and continues and continues in 1970, uh, and then into 1980, and then it rolls over. It just kind of mitigates, and that's uh, kind of the base case um, that we see as well. There is a lot of pressure. Um, going on right now, but it will mitigate out this this bubble. We will adjust to a number of things. We will bring more uh, inventory back online um, and those sorts of things. This is not going to go forever. That's really how Zillow blew up. Um, so B Zillow had four billion dollars dedicated to this, and what they said they had an exponentially weighted model. And so as the as the prices went up and up and up, um, they just said it's going to continue at that same uh, first derivative. It's just going to continue to go up and up and up. And then at some point, you know, it's going to go vertical. So it doesn't matter what we pay. So they massively overpaid for a period of time um, and it was non-sustainable. So, and if you want to go to the next slide, I think this one's really interesting too. Um, so there's the normal, the, the heavy line is the normalized. Um, the, uh, the spike um, is what they call the natural. Um, and that's what they, that's what they forecast is at some point in time when there's all this pressure uh, with the baby boomers is it will, it should act relatively normal. People should be able to look forward, but it's not going to act that way. There's going to be a spike and then the spike will mitigate over time. And that's again, um, probably what we're continuing to see now, definitely over the last year. So Ernest talked a little bit about, um, rents going up by 11%. That's against a background of single family residential going up by 20%. So we are seeing that spike. Um, we do expect that spike to mitigate uh, off it, but you can also see on this graph that the prices never go, it, the, the prices aren't going negative. So um, if you go uh, um, to uh, the next one, so um, the next slide. So they, they've looked at a number of other, yeah, you're, you're on the right one. So they've, they've looked at a number of other things and they said, hey, look, let's, let's make sure that we, we look at interest rates. Interest rates obviously impact the affordability. Interest rates obviously impact the net price. They find that, that whatever, in, uh, whatever input that has is, mass, is outweighed by just the fact that there's the, 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 the golf ball going through the Cobra. So it's just that is the big offset. The big offset is, is there's a lot of people, there's more demand than supply. And the price, and that's what's going to be the driver, even uh, with um, uh, interest rates going up. So the conclusion, uh, their conclusion, um, basically, the, 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 I found the, the, the last paragraph of their conclusion. Their conclusion is um, that the big driver here is the number of people. There's more demand than supply. That that offsets out, uh, outweighs uh, interest rates. That outweighs a number of those sorts of things. Uh, that is the driver that it will persist for a period of time. There will be this kind of outsized uh, period of, um, you know, kind of silly things going on. That's probably where we are, but then it will moderate uh, and, and we'll, we'll get back to, it, it's not prices are going back down. We're not having a crash like 2008 where there were too many financial buyers. This is actually demand driven rather than financially driven. Um, so um, it'll, it'll continue to go. Uh, but prices will moderate back out according to their study, and we would agree. 
the, the second, the, the, the last paragraph is, um, you know, why wouldn't a rational person then puke out their house uh, and uh, buy it back later at a lower price? And they'll, they'll go through three reasons. You know, there's the tax reasons, there's the, um, the, dis, the dislocate reasons, and there's all those other search reasons. So, so you're, you're not going to want to do that. So, so now let's talk a little bit about some of the dislocations that that creates. Again, if we're, if, if, um, that we're seeing this time. Right, so this is, I think, is a really interesting graph. This is the Phoenix area graph, um, and the, uh, they've broken down the prices into three different uh, tiers, right? The very low end, the mid tier, and the high end, right? And what all we're gonna do is we're gonna look and see which one of those moves relative to the other one. So if we're seeing a demand, uh, these first time buyers, not the real low end first time buyers, but if we're seeing first, first time buyers purchasing, of course, which, which homes are they gonna buy? Are they gonna buy the, the, the starter homes or the, or the lower priced homes, the mid priced homes or the high priced homes? Of course, they're gonna put pressure on, this low, on the low priced homes. And that's exactly what we're seeing. The green line here is the low priced homes. And you can see that it's, out, it's outgrowing. It's outgrowing the, um, any of the other tiers by, by, um, by 10, or, 10 or so percent. It's a lot. It's so much so that we are now seeing people skipping buying the first home and they're moving, they're moving right into that second tier home. So, you know, are we seeing dislocations based on this? Absolutely. And this is one of them. The lower priced homes are going up. If you want to go to the next uh, one too. So um, this is existing home sales. We have saw existing home sales. This is a continuation of a theme, by the way. So um, I just picked this one up. Um, you've got existing home sales. Before that, you've got pending home sales. Pending home sales doesn't give it in this level of detail. So we take it in this level of detail so we can see um, what's going on. And existing home sales are slowing. It's not just the refi market we're seeing, um, we're seeing some slowdown. But if you go to the next slide, it's not across the board. So this is a lot of numbers. Sorry for throwing a lot of numbers at you, but um, what they're going to do is they're going to split it into tiers. Um, this is um, the National Association of Realtors, and they're going to split it into tiers, five tiers, five buckets. And if you look, um, if you look on the top chart, and you and they break it out by region as well, which is is very useful. But the zero to a hundred thousand, the first um, the first column you see, that's where the slow, that's where the massive slowdown is, right? And even in the second tier, from 100 to 250 thousand dollars, that's where the slowdown is as well. So, are people getting priced out, and is that leading to a slowdown? Yeah, that is that is leading to a slowdown. But it's in these it's in these these marginal buyers. Sorry that they're marginal buyers, but they're marginal buyers. That um, uh, Chris was kind of making fun of the the, the millennials that were going to live forever in their basement. And, you know, oh, that's a horrible thing. Well, the funny thing is, is they are actually in a better cash position than their, than their parents were because they were saving money while they were doing it. Um, there's a number of studies that show that um, now. So that they, they are in better financial condition. They are not the marginal buyer. They are actually in good condition. Uh, they've got good income. Um, they are, and, and they actually have uh, a, a fairly solid down payment. So um, they are the three, they are the 500 to $750,000 buyer. And you can see there, if you're going to say, if you're going to say what the percentage change is there, yeah, it's negative, but it's it's barely negative. It's it's negative by 0.7 percent. And you can see that the people who are in good condition, they're not worried about their first home, the five to seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Sales are actually up there. It's not down. It's up. So the reason that you've got a pyramid, right? You've got a bunch of houses down here at the low end, and then you've got fewer houses up at the high end. So what happens down at the low end is driving the whole thing, of course. Um, so that's how you end up with the headline number at a negative 2.7. And then if you look on the same, uh, the same chart, um, look at the bottom, look at median days on market. So this is where we're seeing all of the pressure. Median days on market you're saying, well, you know, it slowed down at the low end. That's because of the what we were talking about before. There's no inventory. That's not true. There is inventory at the low end. This includes condos as well. So, you know, the marginal buyers um, uh, is not detached single family residential, but it's still single family residential. And the median days on market is 24 days. There is a lot of inventory still here. It's not as much as the six months that we, we normally look at, but there's inventory on market. And if you look at... Um, 250 to, uh, to 700 to sorry 250 to 500 there's only seven days on market um, so uh, that's where the pressure is and so 
when we're when we're thinking about this, um, you know, is the millennials moving through as all of these first first time home buyers? Is it creating um, some sort of dislocations? It's absolutely creating the dislocations. Those dislocations are relatively. If you think through the dislocations that you think you would see, you are actually seeing, um, and um, and we all we we do expect them uh, to moderate back out. Um, just the final point, um, and then we can take we can move to questions. So uh, one of the final points, um, you know, oh, it's the U.S., it's the U.S., it's the U.S. The U.S. has all these problems. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, it's not the, the U.S. market house. The, the U.S. housing market. Um, is actually mid-priced relative to the other. If you go to the next slide, um, Jeremy, um, it says the U.S. is among the most affordable. Canada has a specific, Canada has some real problems. Um, of course, Taiwan and, and Australia and those sorts of things um, have uh, those sorts of markets have have more significant problems than we are. So we shouldn't really think of ourselves. Uh, we should think of ourselves as having a problem. Yes, that absolutely we need to address. Uh, but we're not the worst in the world, uh, which doesn't mean we should pat ourselves on the back. It means that we can look at some of those other markets and see some of the sorts of things, uh, some of the sorts of pressures, and we can have a significant amount of comfort. Well, they're getting through it and we'll get through it too. The last point, and this is from the same um, article, these are the most affordable houses. So if you're like, I'm sick of it, I'm over it, you know, here's where you're going to go. You're going to go Pittsburgh in the world, by the way, Pittsburgh, Oklahoma City, Rochester, New York, Edmonton, Canada, and St. Louis. So that's where you're going to go. So why do these continue to be underpriced markets or prices that are uh, represent more value? It's because it's, people don't want to live there. There aren't the economic uh, opportunities. There's not the beautiful sun and those sorts of things uh, uh, like there are in Florida. So um, the markets continue to be, you want to look at the same things. You want to look at job growth. You want to look at all of the opportunities and those sorts of things. And that's what's driving real estate. It's not just like, hey, let's go find the cheapest thing out there and buy it. It is, it is a function of value, right? Value is not about price. It's also about all of the other inputs. So, um, so those are so, some of those sorts of things that we um, need to look at. And then if you want to take the last couple of slides, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, that, that's fine. I Think okay, so this is this is a fine one to take a look at, and also just just note that uh, if you want to reach out to to myself or or Rob, I, I think in the beginning I'm sure Michael will provide the information as well to, to answer further questions uh, offline at the same time. But let me just also make a point. This is for everybody who's building portfolios and advising clients out there. Clearly, this is something that we see as an opportunity to probably move, you know, move your change your, your, your situation with your bond, your fixed income allocations, this could represent a portion of that. Now, bear in mind, it's not a, a, a daily liquid traded security. So all those all those caveats said, I want to say that we have this fund has been around since 2017. So five years of consistent performance between 10 to 12% in terms of distribution. All right, annualized, distributed, how like how you like it, as I said earlier, quarterly, monthly, or just rolling it in. But that represents about 600 loans. You saw the states. But I do want to say that we're just under about right around $395,000, $400,000 on the, our average loan size across 600 loans. So we really got nice bite size. We're not going too crazy. You did see a bigger number there in Paradise Valley, maybe a bigger number in Utah. But that's a key, that's a key, some key distinctions. Five years, we've got audited, audited financials. We've got some other things that you can look at. So as you build portfolios, there's a lot of diligence material that's buried in some of these slides that we don't want to get into today. We want to be respectful of your time. We also want to answer your questions. But I think that's a, that's a huge thing. And let me just say this, no offense to the millennials living in, in, in mom's basement. Uh, they're, <laughs> they're moving a, out, they're moving out. Yeah, it's a huge cohort, it's a huge cohort. It's one of the most successful cohorts too. Uh, the millennials and boomers are huge, huge. And millennials are doing really, really well financially. So I, do, I, don't, wanna, I don't wanna pick on anybody out there. That was, not a, that was not a shot. It is just a fact that 10 years ago, everybody wanted to draw conclusions about that. So I think it's very interesting, but. With that said, Boomerang Capital Partners and the Boomerang Finance Fund LLC, like I said, five years of solid track record, 
reach out to us if you have any questions. But we hope we delivered good content. We hope we delivered good educational information as well. And yeah. So if you want to, if yeah. you want to hit the next slide, uh, that yeah. we're just available yeah. on some of the other platforms, and then we can go to the questions slide. Yeah. So if you want to, if you want to uh, work on the sales stuff, talk to Chris. You want to geek out on uh, <laughs> portfolio or any of that other sorts of stuff, reach out to me. And with that, Jeremy. Uh, I thought we might. All right. So is it possible with all the PE um, P -E money chasing single family rentals and uh, maybe the new Noni driving real estate res residences the bubble that will eventually burst? Yeah. Is it possible? You bet. Absolutely. Um, it's interesting, though. I think, you know, I, I think we need to be careful when we think about this. And this is kind of to the point where, you know, think about commercial. Um, uh, what are they trying to buy? What are, what are the people trying to buy? They're trying to buy core, right? They're trying to buy move-in condition, good stuff that I can throw a renter in there. And they're trying to kind of catch this arbitrage that uh, Ernest was talking about. You know, it, rental rents are probably too low. So if I want to buy something, I'll just, I'll just create a portfolio of rentals and eventually it'll catch up to where it should be. That, 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 that's how the arbitrage should, should close. So from, for, from, do we see that? Absolutely. Do we think uh, that, um, you know, there's a lot of money out there buying it, the cash buyers? Yeah, we're seeing it. Do we think that they're going to uh, push it into bubble territory? Uh, again, I think this whole thing moderates. Um, I think we're seeing the same thing that the Harvard guys saw in 1985. I think we're seeing the same things that, that Freddie and Franny are, uh, Freddie and Franny are looking for, um, that, um, you know, this, this, this will moderate. Um, over a period of time. Um, so I don't think, I, th I think absolutely we are a little bit um, ahead of ourselves. Uh, but again, you know, that's the, that's the outsized, um, the, the outsized spike in prices. And then the, 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 the first derivative uh, um, will continue to be positive. Yeah. And if I could just add to that, yeah. different than 08, 07, 08, 09, right? This is cash. We got a lot of cash buyers out there, and I think that makes a difference. So you don't have, you don't have a lot of different. I mean, it could still, it could still be a bubble, certainly. And but I think it's going to be very localized in certain yeah. markets in certain parts of the country. For the product that we look at, I don't want to talk about just boomerang, but for the, what we're looking at, it doesn't really affect it. The the Black Rocks of the world probably not going to buy the the product you saw that I showed you in Houston, right? The older home. They're probably not looking to buy that, even in its what we call uh, after rehab value stage. Okay, so that's just yeah, they'd be buying from from right. our guys. So and and you know the the cash buyers are those black rocks and those sorts of things. Right. So they do create dislocations, um, uh, but we think at this point it's it's not. Um, we think it'll moderate over time. Are they a concern? Absolutely. You know, are we going to go? You know, put our heads in the sand or anything? No. Um, does your firm use leverage? Yes, absolutely. So, yeah, it's a good question. Um, we use a light. Uh, uh, what in in real estate terms uh, is pretty moderate. So we we run around. We for every dollar worth of equity, we borrow about fifty cents or so. Why do we do that? Um, it does enhance returns a little bit. Let's be honest, but that's not the reason we do it. We th we've got investors on one hand and borrowers on the other hand, right? We've got guys that we run in the fund and then we've got borrowers. It is a real bad idea to disappoint either one of those. So if investors put too much money in, investors get out in front of borrowers, great, we're gonna go put your money in the bank at 1% and then you're not gonna get the 10 to 12%. That's not so good. And borrowers, we can't run out of money for the borrowers, right? So if there's, if there's a little bit too much borrowers at the time, we just draw down the bank line and go instead of going from 1.5, uh, you know, we go to 1.6 and 1. Point, maybe 1. 1.7, uh, but that's what we use the bank lines for, and that's about how much we use, uh, about 50 cents for every uh, every dollar worth of equity. Uh, the PPM constricts us; we can't go over uh, one to one, so um, we can't get too far over our skis. Okay. Um, is the deck available for sharing? Yes. Okay. Um, so a lot of people are moving. To warmer states, yeah. do you think that's sustainable? Well, natural disaster risks, like in Florida, I know you guys aren't in Florida, they're in hurricanes, but in other parts of the country that you're in, what are the natural disaster risks? So natural disaster risks in uh, Arizona are pretty limited. Um, so let me talk- Unless you talk about sunburns. Exactly, <laughs> sunburns pretty bad. Arizona, Colorado, Texas, 
we are seeing, you know, there is th that that migration, that move out of um, the, some of those states for whatever reason. Um, we absolutely see that. We would see, you know, we worry more about um, uh, the price risk, right? It's just getting just getting too overbuilt uh, or too underbuilt. Too many people looking for too few houses. So we we worry more about that. The, the states that we're in, we don't worry much about natural disasters. Uh, what about Fed's uh, interest rate hikes? How will this affect the business? Yeah, so you, you look at two different pieces of it. Um, we talked a lot with, um, you know, the, the we're not seeing a huge impact uh, across the board. At the low end, the, the Fed hikes uh, seem to have um, taken some of the steam out of the, 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 the marginal buyers. Um, uh, so that's problematic, but the, the majority of our guys, again, uh, we're not seeing it. As far as the impact to us, uh, our port, we do use a little bit of leverage. So yeah, there's going to be um, some impact to us. It's not much. When we started this business, remember we started back uh, this this fund we started um, in 2017. You know, interest rates were at six. So you know, they they, they were higher. Now they've come down. Now they're coming back up. The returns. Um, you know, are, are pretty consistent. We, we just don't use that much leverage. So it doesn't, doesn't really impact us that much. How do you just select um, what areas to go into? Yeah, so um, there's definitely the states, right? What states do we want to be in? We like, we like Arizona, we like Utah, uh, we like Nevada. Those are regulated states. It, it keeps some of the riffraff out. Um, we're not the only ones that do this. We like a market that, and about a third of our competitors, we have a lot of um, respect for. We like what they do. They do maybe different than we do, but um, we don't like the real bottom feeders, um, that sort of thing. So the regulation keeps those out. We like those. We like uh, non-judicial states. So when, when something goes wrong, we can, um, we can deal with it without having it to go through court. It can go through court. It can, can go through the foreclosure process, but it doesn't have to. Uh, and we like them investor friendly. We like the ability to foreclose. When we foreclose in a, on a house in uh, Arizona, um, we uh, it's 90 days. If we were to do that in California, 270 days, something like that. So, and we, and we do get foreclosures. I mean, um, I don't know if that's gonna be a question or not. We're about a 1% foreclosure rate. Um, normal in our industry is, is three to four. You know, is, it, does that mean that we're so much better than some of those other competitors that we have respect for? Um, it, it's a different business model, right? They're gonna to factor those sorts of things in. They're going to figure out that uh, for what they are consistent, what they're representing and, and comfortable with their investors. Um, because we go meet our investors, because we uh, have a have a budget, because we do the draw process, because we do our own servicing, that's what leads to. And, you know, let's be honest too, um, because we're talking at, um, you know, the 30 days, uh, when, when we talk to a servicer at 30 days and we don't want it, we're selling it to an NPL buyer. It's pretty good. It's it, and we will sell it at full price. So yeah, how do you? Uh, what are other tactics or, or how do you vet the people that you're lending to? So um, it's surprising. Um, it, just by meeting them um, is 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 really important. And it's really funny because most of these communities are pretty small, and um, so they people know who is is providing uh, lending to um, uh, you know, a, a certain borrower. And it's funny because if, you, if we get too far down the, the, the quality curve and we lend to somebody, people are like, not only will they come, you know, kind of have a sidebar conversation with us, like, hey, you probably shouldn't be lending to, to that guy. But it reflects negatively on us as well. They're like, well, I thought you guys were kind of quality and we were all kind of good and you're lending to, to, you know, to that guy, what, what's up there? So, um, it's the community. We know the community. Um, we know, and not only do we know the, the community of guys who are also lending, but we know all of their subs. We know not all of their subs. We know a lot of their subs. We know a lot of their suppliers. So we can back check and fact check all of those sorts of things. We're also doing, um, we're also pulling not a hard credit. We'll pull a soft credit. We don't pull hard credit. Um, the reason we don't pull hard credit is it's massively detrimental to our borrowers balance sheet. If our, if our, if our borrowers are doing, you know, a dozen of these a year, uh, and we're going to pull credit and then they're going to pull credit that, you know, they're going to pull credit again. You know, these guys are having their credit pulled, you know, 20 times a year. That's not, not good, but we can pull it soft on them. Um, we can pull a, and that doesn't show up. 
we can do a background check on on them. Background checks happen for our reasons and for other reasons. Uh, and and then we also look at the finances. Uh, we get the financial statements and look at those sorts of things. So that's how we're vetting uh, the borrowers. Yeah, just to, just to piggyback on that, the key is FICO scores are great, right? Credit scores are fantastic. However, you really can't foreclose on a, on a FICO, right? You can take back a property. So that's why we're, we're, we are always in first lien position yeah. on the loans that we make. And then if we have multiple borrower, or one borrower with multiple properties, we cross collateral, not to get too deep in the weeds, we cross collateralize those. So if they have three projects, one's not going so well, they want to let it go. Well, it's not going to work so well because the other two are going to be impaired as well. So they're, they're less likely to give up that one bad property because the other two will fail. Yeah, and there's, that's another um, uh the one of the very useful pieces of information that we would get out of a, off of a credit report that we sometimes get off of a soft pull and sometimes you don't fully get it on the hard pull too. Um, because people are doing things through entities and all of those sorts of things, uh, these are business purpose loans. These are not consumer loans. So these are business purpose loans. Is um, We actually go through in all of the markets that we're in, uh, we go through and look at all of the transactions. So, and then you can get a good idea of who's doing transactions and those sorts of things. And, and um, there's some reasons we do that, but um, you can also see who's out, who's, who's got multiple properties. So it's not a great thing when they, when they go to you and they go, oh, hey, yeah, we're doing two or three properties. And they've got, you know, two or three properties that are active that they're representing to you, but they've got four or five or six on the side. So those guys are over levered. Uh, and we don't think that we don't, we don't think you can find that on a credit report. We think you can find it this other way, um, but um, um, that's that's how we that's how we're trying to figure those those sorts of things out. Do you limit certain municipalities inside of the states? Or oh yeah, yeah. Outside? No, um, so we don't. We we want to be we want to be uh, pretty much suburban. We don't do rural. Those we don't we don't do very much rural. We'll do a little bit of rural, but we don't do a lot of rural. Um, so we, 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 we limit the municipalities and, you know, generally it's the, the, the MSAs, uh, the major statistical areas, and we don't do a whole lot of rural. How far outside the uh, urban areas? Uh, well, outside urban, and then you've got suburban, right? right? And then uh, urban and suburban, we're going to be good. Uh, once you get outside that rural and the tertiary markets, we're, um, will we lend on those? You bet. Um, but the, the lending parameters are going to be different. Okay. Uh, what states would you be going into next? So, um, like I said, we're going into Nevada. Um, we like Idaho quite a bit. Um, Idaho has some problems with it as well as far as size. Uh, the market is, is going well. Um, but um, we're not going into New Mexico uh, or any of those sorts of things. So pretty much we're sticking Western states. We, um, uh, I don't know if this person's familiar with it or not. We tried North Carolina. Uh, we were pretty excited about North Carolina from a 30,000 uh, uh, foot view. It was great. We started attending the meetings. We started talking to the people. We were deep in with uh, a number of um, uh, big players. The problem is, is they're, they're, the um, uh, competitors will rent will, will uh, lend 100%. We, we're not lending 100%. We're 85 at, at best. So, and we think that it's a real mistake to be lending 100% guys have no skin in the game. That's not going to work out well for us. So um, we put a lot of effort into that one and, and that one we're, we're not doing. But those are a couple of the markets we're looking at. Um, we are really busy in Arizona, Colorado, Texas, Utah, um, Nevada. So um, we're a little, little slow to, to get too excited about anything else. And which of those, this is two minutes left, of those states uh, are you most excited about? All of, them, all of them for different reasons. Um, Arizona, so Arizona is an interesting market because um, there's a lot more turnover. People are uh, moving up houses. There's a lot more inventory. There's a lot more turnover. Uh, Texas is the same thing. Uh, we are in Austin. Um, we're a little bit less excited about that. Um, Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, there is a current, um, uh, the beginning of a bill to restrict people from being able to do this. So, um, uh, but they're all different for different reasons. Yeah, I would just say, just like in equity, Texas has its own characteristics, its own beta, yeah. right? it, it, its own volatility. Alpha, alpha, alpha. Yeah. Arizona, thank you. Arizona's got its own numbers and it moves to its own, its own sort of beat. 
right? Uh, Utah, same thing there, Nevada and, and Idaho as we're finding out. But they all do, again, this is all about the portfolio construction. So the, it's a great question, but they all do move differently. So we don't want to be over levered in any one area. Yeah. Or I'm sorry, overexposed in any one area. All right, can you guys take it back to Mike? All right, thanks so much, everybody. Thank we you. Appreciate that, and we'll we'll turn it back to Michael Corselli. We appreciate the time. Thank you. thank you guys. I appreciate you uh, doing the presentation today and, and being part of our organization. I also thank everybody who's uh, attended today for your time and your attention. Um, we are bringing together a world-class group of thought leaders that are solving America's housing crisis. And as you can tell, they love what they do. And this is our community. This is the community that basically is on the front lines and loves to educate and inform investors on various uh, strategies that they're employing in the alternative investment world. So thank you very much for your time today.